the Air Force Thunderbird roar over the course in salute as fans of every age pack the grandstand and line the world-famous four-mile beach and road course. And the fans are waiting to see what the automaker's new models will do when the chips are down. Hello, everyone, and welcome into our review of the 1958 Daytona Beach and Road Course Race, the last beach and road course race before NASCAR transitioned over to the big speedway. We're going to welcome in my buddy, Ken Martin, NASCAR historian. I'm Jonathan Merriman. And, Ken, we did this last summer with the infield modified race from the 70s at Daytona International Speedway. It blew my mind because you were there. 1958, Ken Martin was here at this last beach and road course race, so my mind is blown for a second time. Talk to me about being down there. Well, Jonathan, for one thing, it just means I'm old. But uh, but to be at the beach in 1958 was really the experience of my young childhood. I was nearly six years old. My dad, my sister, my mom and I, uh, took a trip from their home in Lynchburg, Virginia, down to uh, to Daytona Beach just to uh, to see the race, to see the sights, to see, hear the sounds, and uh, you know, again, for a young boy, it was the trip of a lifetime. Now we'll transition into talking about the building of the big speedway and and why this was the last beach and road course race. Now we've kind of conversed a little bit offline, and and you remember driving past the big open field where Bill France had the vision to to put kind of the staple of our sport, Daytona National Speedway. Yeah, for really for almost five years, Bill France had wanted to transition from the from the temporary beach course to a permanent facility. And it really wasn't until late in 1957 that all of the financing and planning could come together where Bill France could actually sign the lease. So they did a little site prep in, in November. In February of 58, they had sort of a formal groundbreaking, although the work had, all, had actually begun. And, uh, you know, we drove out Route 92, could see the ground being moved, but there was no structures built yet. It was just the open field where you could look across and see all the way over to the uh, to the airport. Now let's talk about what goes into preparing a race car in 1958. I think we have some footage of, of Smokey Unix shop uh, and them preparing Paul Goldsmith's car. Um, some interesting stuff here, you know, we'll see in a few minutes of open road testing. So driving a race car down the street, that's equivalent of me here in Charlotte driving down Interstate 85 and all of a sudden Kevin Harvick comes flying by. So wild times back in 58. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it was a different world. And and down in the uh, at Smokey's, what he called the best damn garage in town, you can see he and Paul Goldsmith working on this 58 Pontiac. But to test the car, you know, there was no track for them to go test on. The beach was open to the public. The highways were open to the public. So they found some deserted spots on the roads of, uh, of Florida, and they would take the car out. But as you can see in some of the video, Paul is driving past motorists as they're, as they're on the road. It was such a different world. We see the construction of the car. Smokey was such an innovator uh, with his uh, X-formed uh, uh, roll cage. You see how simple the gauges were. The engine uh, is where Smokey made his money and made his name. His shops were right there on Beach Street in Daytona Beach. And so, uh, you know, literally they could take the car from the shop to the beach and road course without having to, to tow it or anything else. Uh, so there were several other racing teams that were based in the Daytona area. Um, you know, certainly Marshall Teague was down there. The folks with Fish Carburetor had a team. And a lot of the talent obviously gravitated towards Daytona Beach. And actually, in our in our footage, we actually have Paul Goldsmith, who drove for Smokey Unic, narrating a lap of this speedway. So, I mean, 
for for those of us who didn't see it and will never be able to drive a race car on the old beach and road course, it's kind of cool that we can go back and and hear from a pilot of of a very good race car back in that era drive that racetrack. Why you have a tendency to fishtail and spin all the way up the entire beach clear to the north turn. You get out fairly wide next to the ocean and you go into a soft sand before you get to the hard shale and the bank turn and then your car's pitching and bouncing and about the middle of the turn you broadside a little bit and you get a hold of that black top and it, your tires squeal for a little ways and it starts accelerating tremendously down the back stretch and the speed that you reach on the back stretch is in excess of 140 mile an hour. It's several spots. I mean, all four wheels will leave the ground from, that's how rough it is going down through there. There's one point that uh, I'd say all four wheels must be all oh, six inches in the air, it feels like when you're in the car. And, and then you touch your brakes as it's coming down. Where we drop off into the high bank turn, which is a uh, shale, clay and dirt and sand and it gets pretty slippery. You proceed through the turn and you're coming out on the beach. You know, it was a mix of surface, it was a mix of, of speed and uh, and it took really skilled drivers to, uh, to win on the beach at Daytona. Well, let's talk about the three series that, that race down there. You had Convertible Series, Modified Sportsman, and then, of course, Grand National, which is now what we call the Cup Series. Starting with Modified Sportsman, uh, six-year-old Ken Martin sitting in the grandstands, and all of a sudden uh, Glenn Wood qualifies on the pole, I believe, and, and he did a little bit of racing in your neck of the woods uh, when you were a kid. So what's it like for a six-year-old Ken Martin to see uh, not necessarily a hometown hero but a familiar face so far away in Florida? Yeah, my dad was the promoter at the Lynchburg Speedway. Some people called it Schrader Field. And so it attracted a lot of local racing talent, but talent from all from Virginia and North Carolina. And Glenn Wood was a regular at our track. But to see him down at Daytona on a, on a two and a half uh, mile course uh, was spectacular. And the fact that he was the fastest qualifier driving a sportsman car there were two classes that ran together the sportsman and the modified the modifieds they could run turbochargers they could run blowers and and glenn was in a sportsman car that was only allowed to run a carburetor so the fact that glenn was almost at 140 miles an hour and just a carbureted uh, car was was really special and uh, he ended up finishing third in this race that was won by Banjo Matthews. Banjo was driving the M4 for the fish carburetor folks. And again, they were a Daytona business that, that specialized in speed equipment and high performance carburetors. Uh, Banjo won the last modified sportsman race on the beach. Then he won the first modified sportsman race on, at the Daytona Speedway in 1959. You know, Banjo went on to, to uh, be the owner of Cup Cars that Donnie Allison uh, won, won for. But then in the 80s, he was the dominant car builder for what was then the Winston Cup Series. There were some races in the 80s that every car in the field was built by Banjo Matthews Speed Shop down in North Carolina. Let's switch gears and uh, we'll put the top down for this one. We're talking about Florida, of course. You got to have a convertible. We'll talk about the convertible series. So Lee Petty on the pole, a name we're familiar with, and the winner of this thing was Curtis Turner, another name we're fam we're familiar with. We'll get more familiar in just a few minutes. But um, what was the convertible series like to watch? The convertible series started in 1956. And it was NASCAR's attempt to take advantage of the popularity of convertibles, much like, you know, when they started the truck series in the 90s, it was to take advantage of the popularity of, of, of pickups. But to think about it, convertibles on the beach at Daytona, there couldn't be anything cooler than that, especially if you're a young kid like me, you've got the beach in the background, the waves rolling in, 
you've got these superstar drivers out there in these really cool cars and it just captured everyone's imagination and one of the things that bill france did in 1958 was he allowed what they called zipper tops and in this way a car that could race on saturday in the convertible race could race on sunday in the grand national race so the car that we're eating in here on uh, on saturday as a convertible they put a top on it and he raced that same car on sunday and that's the way a number of competitors uh, did so they got double duty out of their uh, out of their cars the cars are the same ones you see every day on the highway but there's a definite difference in the drivers at daytona beach florida where wide open speed is king in the grand national for late model stocks 160 miles of sand and macadam make this race one of the toughest all right, Ken, let's shift gears another time. Let's go to the Grand National Series, what is now the Cup Series. So this was the big show. Six-year-old Ken Martin sitting in those grandstands uh, on the beach and road course. What was the anticipation like watching some of these big-name guys in these uh, in these in in the Cup Series uh, race out here for the last time on the beach and road course? Yeah, anticipation was great. And there were 35,000 people there, which you've got to think in 1958, that many people packed around that beach and road course. The place was overflowing. The sights, the sounds, and it was a pretty cold day. As I recall, it was, it was cold, but at least it was bright and sunny. But the big stars were here. Here's Smokey Eunuch with Paul Goldsmith. Here's Holman Moody with Curtis Turner. Here's Lee Petty. Here's here's really, you know, a roll call of the drivers that are now in the NASCAR Hall of Fame from the first uh, decade of the sport. Well, Ken, we might not have a Smokey Eunuch race car on hand, but what we do have is plenty of footage of that number three and of that 19. 19- 58 race. So we're going to start rolling some of this footage. Just walk me through what you're seeing and what you remember and and give the fans at home a sense of of what it was like to see this in person. Well, one thing that was really cool, the Thunderbirds were there. Just like in this year's Daytona 500, the Thunderbirds do a flyover. They were at Daytona. And so that just shows you what a big event it was. But then when you mix what we see of the beach and the sand and the cars and the sound of those cars, it was just an attack on your senses. You think about a sport that came from moonshining, then went to the beach. I don't know how you could have a sport more appealing to young race fans. They started the race going down the uh, pavement of A1A, and the starting line was down near the south turn. They did that so that all the cars would be on pavement when the green flag came out. So the green flag flies, and then they make their way into the south turn. And we see Goldsmith immediately jump to the front there as the cars roll out onto the beach for the first time at speed. And there we see the next car, Curtis Turner, driving the uh, Holman Moody car, immediately jumps into second place. There's a spin early on in the race. There was a driver named Dick Foley uh, who was involved in that spin, and he is one of the very first Canadian drivers to ever come to Daytona to race. Here we're looking at the north turn. Uh, turn announcer Chris Economaki was there calling the action. And it's uh, already boiling down to Turner and Goldsmith with Goldsmith in the lead. Watching these big, heavy race cars on these little narrow tires slide from the asphalt to the beach and then to the beach from the asphalt. The power slides in these things were amazing. Yeah, and you know, a lot of the a lot of the races in those days was on dirt. So a lot of the guys, especially we knew Curtis Turner was a master of the power slide. He was great at throwing a car in a four-wheel drift uh, broad sideways. And but as you said, the tires were not specific racing tires. These were tires that you could go to your Firestone and Goodyear store and buy. And so, so when you think about a, a tire that has to adjust to 
the grip of the asphalt and the the slick of sand, it, it really shows how the cars had to be set up. And um, there we saw Smokey out on pit road holding up a pit sign to Goldsmith. Let him know that he had a pair a fairly significant uh, a uh, significant lead here. There we see Curtis Turner muscling his way, uh, uh, you know, through the corner. Goldsmith and Unick went to a Pontiac in 1958 because General Motors wanted to sell more Pontiacs. Uh, there again, we see Turner through the south turn and, and Goldsmith out onto the beach. An interesting thing about the races on the beach, the starting times were based upon the tides. They would usually try to start the race about an hour to an hour and a half before low tide so that the tide is going out and they could time it so that when the tide would come back in, the race would be the race would be over. But the tide would do the natural job of packing the, the, the sand. And so some years the race might be at 10 in the morning. Some years it might be at three in the afternoon. And that was the case in 1958. I think the start time for this race was about 3.30 or so um, in the afternoon. As we see, uh, I think it's Curtis Turner go off track here. Yeah. But, uh, you know, this is this is coming down uh, to two cars. And despite this, this spin here, we had the closest finish in beach and road course history. Yeah, it wasn't unusual at the beach and road course for a driver to win by you know, a, a, a lap or at least a couple of miles. We're talking about a four mile course here, two miles down the beach, two miles up uh, A1A. And usually, and, and everybody had to make a pit stop for fuel. Um, it wasn't always necessary to change tires or anything, but everybody would have to stop for fuel. And back then the fuel stops would run about 45 seconds or so. But you see the fans packed along the inside of the track. And, um, you know, here's Goldsmith taking the checkered flag. He just had a few car length lead over Turner. As we said, uh, the closest finish in beach and road course history. Uh, uh, Goldsmith taking his victory lap there with Turner, you know, right behind him. But uh, the fans were able to pour out of the stands across the beach. Uh, you know, and, and really made it a, a, a festive scene. And as, uh, you know, as Goldsmith pulls in, um, you know, th they know that this is the last race on the beach and road course. And, you know, as the fans left, there was a great deal of nostalgia, uh, a great deal of uncertainty about the his about the sport and what direction it would go, you know, just up the road you know, a two and a half mile super speedway construction had just started. And we know that that speedway changed the course of racing forever. Well, let's talk about the significance of that. And, and you know, we know that that next year, you know, Lee Petty won, albeit three days later after some, some footage was reviewed and uh, pictures were reviewed. Um, Daytona International Speedway, you know, we just finished up with the Rolex there. We do have the Daytona 500 coming up on February 14th. Uh, what a special place um, to to be able to, to watch a race, A, and to be able to, you know, when everything's normal, go to Florida. You can stand at that north turn and, and, and reflect on that, but then go catch a race at, at one of the, you know, most magnificent things you know, in the automotive racing world's ever been built. Yeah, you know, the, the beach and road course has such great nostalgia. And and in the decade of the 50s, that was the perfect spot for, for the sport to be born. But when we looked into the 50, late 50s into the 60s, Bill France knew that he needed a permanent facility and if he was going to build a, per, a permanent facility, he wanted to make it perfect. And, and his design of the two and a half mile Daytona International Speedway was an engineering marvel. You know, Indianapolis had been around for a long time, but it was flat. Bill wanted to make a track with high bank turns. And he also wanted to build a track 
that had a trial to it because he had been to races at Langhorn where the track was a circle. And he, he saw that the fans sitting in a circle can see the cars coming towards them as well as the cars going away from them. So that was part of Bill's design uh, for the front stretch at Daytona, not to be straight, but to be curved. And so, again, Bill used everything that he had learned about racing over the past uh, 20 years into building that facility. And that facility changed everything for the sport. All of a sudden, cars were faster. Aerodynamics came into play. That was something we'd never even heard about until we started racing at the Speedway. And so the cars had to be more durable. The cars had to be more reliable. Within a few years, new super speedways were built at Charlotte, Atlanta, Rockingham, then a little bit later in Michigan. And the sport just, uh, like I said, Daytona changed everything. Well, Ken, we certainly appreciate the knowledge from someone who was on the ground in 1958. It was great picking your brain. We're going to cut you loose. We're going to get out of here. But before we go, you guys watching at home, make sure you tune in to the Daytona 500. It's February 14th, Valentine's Day at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time on Fox.